In this video, we're going to be talking about passive filters. A passive filter basically just means that a circuit's not going to have an amplifier inside of it. You can build a passive filter with things like resistors, capacitors, or inductors. I have an example of a different kind of passive filter right here in front of me though, and it's the high impedance headphones that we looked at in a previous video. The reason why this can behave like a filter is because the speaker inside the headphones or the diaphragm can't respond at very high frequencies. For example, if I send an audio signal through this wire into the speaker to command the diaphragm to move in and out at a frequency that's say 100 hertz in the audio range, then the diaphragm won't have any trouble moving at that frequency. On the other hand, if I were to send a very high frequency signal, say a megahertz, through the same wiring in order to command the diaphragm to move in and out a million times a second, which corresponds to a one megahertz signal, it wouldn't be able to do it. It filters out the high frequency signals mechanically. But we can also make filters using electrical components too. The main function of a filter is to allow some frequencies to pass through while blocking other frequencies. Our headphones here are representative of a low pass filter. It allows through the low audio frequencies while blocking the higher frequencies. The fact that the headphones behave as a low pass filter was useful in a previous video when we wanted to decode the information in a spark gap transmission. I'll show you another example of a filter. It's in this circuit diagram right here. I know that you've not probably seen a circuit diagram this complicated before, but we can usually identify where the filter is. You can identify filters by looking for capacitors and inductors grouped together in a circuit. These two capacitors and inductor right here are an example of a passive filter. In this particular video, we're going to be taking a look specifically at one pole filters, and I'll show you in just a moment what I mean when I say one pole. But first, I'm going to show you two examples of such filters. One contains a capacitor and a resistor, and the other contains an inductor and a resistor. I'm going to derive the transfer function in other words, the output voltage divided by the input voltage. Let's start here with the circuit on the left. I'm going to be using voltage division. In the numerator, we have the impedance of the capacitor, and in the denominator, we have the impedance of the whole circuit. Let's now multiply everything in this fraction by j omega c. This is a transfer function, and we usually use the letter h, a capital H, in order to represent it. H is a function of j omega. By the way, sometimes instead of j omega, you might see the letter s. The reason why sometimes you'll see s and sometimes you'll see j omega is just because s is used in the Laplace transform and j omega is used in the Fourier transform. We're not going to talk about these transforms in this particular video. Just keep in mind that sometimes j omega can be written with an s. If we divide everything in this fraction by RC, then we'll wind up with a useful form for this expression. I'll show you later what I mean. Let's try to do the second circuit. We have an inductor and a resistor in the circuit, and again, I want to use voltage division in order to find the transfer function. We have R in the numerator, and then we have the impedance of the whole circuit in the denominator. Let's now divide everything by R in this fraction. Now that we have our transfer function h in terms of j omega, we could alternatively write it with an s. If I try to remove any coefficient that's next to the s in this fraction, for example, by multiplying everything here times r divided by l, I'll end up with this final version form of the expression. You might notice that the forms of these two expressions are very similar. They both have just a single s in the denominator, and then they have simply a coefficient in the numerator. The fact that these fractions have only a single s in the denominator means that they have a single pole. That's what a pole is. It refers to the order of the s in the denominator of a transfer function. Typically, you can look at a circuit and also figure out how many poles it has just by inspection. You can just count up how many inductors or capacitors it has. For example, in our circuit here on the left, we see one capacitor. In our circuit on the right, we see one inductor. Therefore, both of these circuits are examples of one-pole filters. However, that doesn't always work. Let me show you an example of something that's a one-pole filter, even though it has two inductors in it. Although we have inductors L1 and L2 here in the circuit, this is still a one-pole filter because these two inductors are mathematically combinable. If you can combine these inductors into one, you'll only have one inductor. If you can't combine them, then you'll wind up with a two-pole filter rather than a one-pole filter. 
In other words, you have to start with a circuit that's already been simplified before you can use this trick of counting up the reactive components in order to determine the number of poles in a filter. Let's see if we can look at the forms of the equations and work out the fact that these are both low-pass filters. In other words, why do they pass the low frequencies rather than the high frequencies? Let's focus here on the J omega forms for H. And by the way, I'm switching back and forth so you can get some experience in viewing the transfer function using both J omega and the S forms. You'll notice that both of these expressions here have the same form. It turns out that the coefficient sitting just in front of the J omega term in each of these two expressions has the units of seconds. RC, that is ohms times farads, has units of seconds. Similarly, L divided by R, or Henry's divided by ohms, also has the units of seconds. These are both time constants. It's an RC time constant, or it's an L over R time constant. So here in the shared form, I'm calling it T. Check out what happens to this expression when the frequency omega approaches zero. You see, the transfer function H just gets closer and closer to one, the smaller the omega gets. In other words, if the transfer function is one, then the signal completely makes it through the filter because the output voltage is equal to the input voltage. But what happens if the frequency omega starts to get really high? What happens if the omega approaches infinity? Well, if omega approaches infinity, the magnitude of the denominator starts to grow very high. As the denominator gets larger, the fraction as a whole gets smaller and smaller and the transfer function goes to zero. That's why it blocks the high frequencies, and that's what makes this a low pass filter. Let's see what that transfer function looks like when we plot it out. By the way, our equation here for the transfer function gives us a complex number. What I'm plotting though is the magnitude. How do you find the magnitude of something that's complex? Well, we can apply the Pythagorean theorem. We can take the magnitude of the top, which is just one, and we can take the magnitude in the denominator as well. What's the magnitude of this number in the denominator? Well, let's plot it on the complex plane. I'm plotting here just the denominator. We have a real axis and we have an imaginary axis. We're going to move a distance one right on the real axis and then we're going to move up a distance of omega t along the imaginary axis. The magnitude is represented by this hypotenuse. We can just use the Pythagorean theorem to find its length. One squared plus omega squared t squared gives us that magnitude. And now we have the magnitude of the transfer function itself. That's what's plotted right here. You can confirm that it's a low pass filter by checking out what happens as the frequency gets small. As the frequency gets lower and lower, the magnitude of the transfer function gets higher and higher and approaches one when the frequency reaches zero or a DC signal. As the frequency gets higher and higher, it approaches zero. Normally though, this is not how it's plotted. We typically use a logarithmic scale to plot transfer functions. This is what the same transfer function looks like when it's plotted on a logarithmic scale. Let me show you how it's done. Of course, the magnitude of the transfer function is the same as it just was. Only the plot along the x-axis here has been changed. But what about the y-axis? How do we change that into decibels? Well, because we're dealing with voltages here, we can convert the linear scale into the logarithmic scale by taking 20 times the log of the magnitude. What's nice about plotting the transfer function this way is it makes the function of the filter readily apparent. Look at what happens here at very low frequencies. The curve flattens off. This is the zero decibel line. Zero decibels just means that the output equals the input or one. As the frequency gets higher and higher though, the filter starts to work and these frequencies are all blocked. They're blocked more and more the higher the frequency gets. What I want you to notice though is that the curve is almost linear when we plot it on a logarithmic scale. What we can see here is that at a frequency of 10, this line intersects minus 20 dB. We can see that a frequency of 100 intersects the line here at negative 40 dB. In other words, we have a 20 decibel per decade roll off. The fact that the filter transfer function rolls off at 20 decibels per decade at high frequencies is related to it being a one pole filter. It turns out that we get 20 decibels per decade per pole. So if we had hypothetically had a two pole filter rather than a one pole filter, it would have rolled off at 40 decibels per decade rather than 20 decibels per decade. We'll look at two pole filters in a later video, but for now it's worth noticing where the roll off starts to occur. Right here where the graph makes a downturn is called corner frequency, basically where omega times time constant equals one. Now why does it turn down there? Well, 
As I mentioned before, if the omega is a really small number or close to zero, the magnitude of the transfer function just gets close to one or zero decibels. But as the frequency gets very high, then the transfer function just goes to zero. Right here, the corner frequency is where the power is down by a factor of two, or the voltage is down by a factor of square root of two. A factor of two in terms of power corresponds to a three decibel change on the log scale. That's why it crosses the vertical line here at negative three decibels. Sometimes this is also called the characteristic frequency of the filter or the cutoff frequency of the filter. Along with corner frequency, there are a few different ways to refer to this. Along with a magnitude, we also have the phase. How do we find the phase of a complex number? Let's multiply both the numerator and the denominator of this fraction by the complex conjugate of the denominator. This simplifies to a single complex number. It has a real part and an imaginary part. Here's the real part, and here's the imaginary part. It's negative, so we're going to have to go downhill here. What we're looking for is this phase angle. We can find that phase angle by taking the arc tangent. We make a note that it's always negative here, and it's going to be bound between zero degrees and negative 90 degrees. That's exactly what we're seeing here in the plot. Notice what happens right when omega t equals one. That's the arc tangent of one, which is negative 45 degrees here. That's right where this blue line cuts across the vertical axis of the graph here, right at negative 45 degrees. What we can conclude here is that a single pole low pass filter will shift the phase of a signal passing through the filter. The amount of phase shift, of course, depends on the frequency, but that phase shift is always going to lie somewhere between zero degrees and negative 90 degrees.